A lot of people don't get to see this. The rule was back then you were on one carburetor. That is from the race where Darrell Waltrip and Earnhardt wrecked. Somebody sent me a poop in the mail and then, <laughs> then I got... I got so we drove up to Virginia to talk to Ronnie Thomas here. Ronnie Thomas is one of the last independents on the NASCAR circuit. He was Rookie of the Year in 1978. He has way more cool stuff than you would ever expect. Leonard Wood built this in 1953. I went down with my dad 2012, I think, and Glenn Woods came out. Glenn said, I don't think that's mine. My dad said, yeah. I give Leonard $25 for it in about 57, somewhere along there, 56. Leonard come in and he walked right around and had that and he looked right at us and he said, I ain't believing you still have that. <laughs> that quick. It's two two barrel Strombergs on top. Okay, the rule was back then you were on one carburetor. So what they did, they had an air cleaner on it. They didn't go, from what I understand, to the extreme now stripping something apart, you know, taking it to the extreme to look at everything in the car. So what Leonard done, he had an air cleaner on this. He had one carburetor on the bottom <laughs> and it's gutted out. So it's got two, I mean, you could tell they didn't have the best of machinery back then, uh, you know, meal work to do stuff with. So it's two two barrels there. I mean, a, a two barrel here, it's been hollered out. Then you got two two barrels here and you can see how much bigger the holes are just in those four little holes don't equal what that's that's awesome so technically what it mounted to glenn was running a big technically a four barrel you know against two barrels so you know and, and when leonard signed it he was like you know leonard signed it and he was like um don't really, he wasn't too crazy about that getting out there. But, you know, how many people didn't do stuff like that? Yeah. I didn't see that. It was normal. It's, but, it's okay to talk about it. Yeah, we got ready to go, and we was down there a couple hours, got ready to go. We was in the back, come to the front, and I said, um, Eddie, where's the carburetor outfit? It's in there. He had it in the uh, showcases. <laughs> he said, man, we need that. That'd be the first piece, <laughs> mechanical piece that Leonard made. And I told him, I said, later on, I'll get with you all, you all about putting it in the museum. But, you know, it was ours for two or three years. My dad gave $25 for it, became his. It has been our in our possession since then. <laughs> and what my dad said, you know, he passed away in 215. You know, a year or two before he left, he said, it's yours. If you want to sell it, sell it. If you want to trade it, trade it. It's up to you and I'm gone. And I'm just, you know, it's a, to me, this is a very unique piece of racing history. Definitely. So <laughs> you kind of like, you hate to get rid of it. This is a piece right here. Talk about cheating. I'll show you a cheater piece. When I drove James Hilton's car three or four times, his crew chief, our crew guy, they were having, some of them had cheater motors. We never had one. Uh, we just wasn't smart enough to do the deal. 358, as big as you was allowed to run, 358 cubic inches. Take number one spark plug out of your motor, and you would screw this in number one cylinder, and then they had this tube that went on. It was a tube, a clear tube. And that thing, it'd spin a motor, burr, 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 and this little rubber gas would go, burr, 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 and it would stop. Of course, they had a chart. Then they come out these pieces, and what you do, you take yours, you, when they're sitting there, the fish will be here, and then, hey, how's your wife doing? So whoever's doing, how's your wife doing all this? And he'd be getting tension while he's getting their tension. You'd have yours laying down there, the screw jack somewhere along there. you pick yours up, lay his there and you screw yours in the head and you had these two little orifices in here and you see how big the hole is in this that's the hole hmm. okay yours would be like this you screw yours in it's depending on what size you run the 370 cubic inch or 388 cubic inch different hole size you take this you screw this in and you'd be talking to guy all right 
air. You slide the tube on there. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, you look good. You, you take this out. You know, you just take it, unscrew it, lay it on there. If you talk to a guy and you take his piece, you give it to him. Your piece is kind of hid. You would change that orifice relative to how oversized your engine actually was to make sure it only pumped yeah. enough air for 358. That's right. 81 Pontiac Grand Prix, and we raced it from, it's actually, we're thinking this is the one that we got from Cecil Gordon in 79, one of Cecil's cars, and we cut it down and made a, they were 115 inch cars. We made a 110 inch car out of it in 81 NASCAR specs, getting rid of the, the long wheelbase car. So we ran it till through the 83 season and then I sold it to a guy in Roanoke and he ran it from 84 till 86. So does it have hundreds of races on it? I don't know. It's got a lot of races on it. So uh, Lenny Pond's driven it and Wendell Scott practiced in it at Martinsville and just had a uh, Dick Mays driven it and James Hilton. So it's had a lot of different drivers. You know, I drove it naturally the most of the time, but you know, we, we would rent it out. Uh, we would, let other people test it. And sometimes, you know, like I said, we get a few bucks here and there to keep us going in racing. Somebody give you a, a little bit of money and drive the car and help us get to the next race. Can you see where you shortened it at? Like, um, um, well, no, you can't tell it. You did it to it. Everybody had a different way of doing it. A lot of times you would take the trailing arms and you move your cross member down and actually pull it forward. Some people cut it from the front uh, every, I've heard different ways. And if you don't know the truth, we did it here at the service station. I actually can't remember where we shortened the car. And what's <laughs> happened to this thing, it's been totaled probably half a dozen times. It's had a front clip, it's had a rear clip, it's had probably three front clips, a couple rear clips. So it was completely totaled at Martinsville. I, the throttle stuck on me in 81, I think it was and went into the first corner wall and just completely crushed the right side and nobody wanted to fix it and a guy by the name of Dick Hutcherson which in their business was Hutcherson Pagan Enterprises in Charlotte Dick said bring it down here strip it down and I'll fix it so we took it to Hutcherson Pagan and they put a front clip on it and fixed the floorboard and the dash patched it back together and we raced, so it's been to Banjo Matthews shop and been a clip and rear put on it and Huster and Pagan's put a front back in on. So this car's been <laughs> been rebuilt quite a few times. It was <laughs> it was a workhorse. And to be honest with you, it's more or less, I guess you'd call it a memory and a dust collector, but we take it around to some vintage get togethers and let you know, educate the people they want to know about what they don't know about racing and show them things on the cars, what was done and, you know, let them know about the history. And that's what I'm all about. I like, I got to be lucky enough to be a part of it. And so we try to educate what we talk. And I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of people talking about educating. I get educated a lot going around meeting people that it was doing things back in the day. And uh, just, you never stop learning. Does it? Um, have an engine come right on yes, yeah. it does yep okay we're, i'm gonna have to ask you about these scales next there's so much in here it's like it's like sensory overload walking in here well um, it's been my life and my dad's life so it's uh from the 50s on up till around 2000. And there will be a story for almost everything in here, so stay tuned for that. This is a 358 cubic inch motor like they run back in the day. A uh, couple guys, I think, I'm not positive on the names, but I think J.D. McDuffie and Bobby Walwack at Dover somewhere, or maybe it was somewhere else. But anyway, they had crashed and bust this oil tank, and I think one of them got burnt by the oil and it was everywhere. So they, this is something that got outlawed. You had to put them... Things have been three places. They've been here, they've been behind the seat, and they've been in the trunk. And I think this one here, best I remember, still has the roll bars where it used, this tank used to be mounted in the trunk. Oh, yeah, let's see that. Yeah. Hey, didn't they put them, there's like a little cradle down here or something? Yeah, I think, we're gonna find out. I haven't looked for, 
a couple of years when I've been in the trunk but I haven't paid attention. But I think I'm wrong and I mean I'm right in saying that. We're gonna find out. Let's see here. Yeah. If you look here you can still see the this is where the tank used to be mounted. So I was lucky not to not to uh, have cut that out and it still got a piece of lead. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think NASCAR allows you to do this. We had lead in the car and this is something I'll show you here that you don't see where I don't know how many people are doing this, have not taken or have leaving it in the car. This was you put what you had in the frame rail and if you need another 30 40 pounds we didn't have an extra piece of frame rail we would bolt to here we'd go behind the seat or the trunk or wherever with the lead and and this piece which means something to me not a lot of people this is a piece that come out of mark martin's car back in the day that so, one mm -hmm. yeah just like i said how do you remember that i just i just remembered that stuff like that it's um I, I don't I just kept up with that. I keep up with the history. You know, I can't tell you what everybody else does or gas, but I know what I've got and ninety nine percent of it I know what I you know, I know what I've got. So So whenever know. Apache stove didn't pay Mark and he <coughs> had to sell everything, you bought stuff from that auction? They had an auction. I got um four jack stands, I got uh, a couple of his um, templates, body templates. This is O2 Martin on it. Yeah, it was his when he. I don't. 81 Buick, so I don't know what that would have. I guess I don't know if that had been a patchy stove or not. I, th I drove that. A lot of people don't know. I relieved for Mark Martin in 83. I got a picture of him and pulling him out of the car. Herb Nav was with him at Pocono, and a hole come in his. Uh, he blew a piece of exhaust out and. It blew through the boot or something. He got sick of the fumes and I got in it. That was 83 and I run about 50 laps and I could, I'll tell you the problem I had, Mark's a little bitty fella. Of course, I, I was like, I was a lot smaller than I am now, but you know, Mark's like, I don't know, five, six, five, seven. And when I got in the car, the steering wheel was into, into me so tight. I had the seat belts pulled as tight as I could. And when I go in a corner, it was actually I had to turn the stern as hard as I could. And I'd run it about 40 or 50 laps. And I told him, I said, man, I'm give out. I just couldn't. It was just too much tension on the stern wheel and they put him back in it. But I ran about, I don't know, probably 50 laps in it. <laughs> so the steering wheel was like rubbing on you? Rubbing so it? tight I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't <laughs> steer it. It looks like you kept a lot of really cool stuff. Some of it is directly related to you and some of it isn't. I'm like, where do you even start with your, your, your house is like a museum. This is really cool. <laughs> well, my dad and he raced, the first year he raced was 58. He ran one year and won a championship up at Radford Speedway, which became Pulaski. And then, like I said, New River and now Motor Mile. My dad saved everything. I've saved everything. And I've traded for a few pieces. I bought three or four pieces and collect a few pieces but a lot a lot of this stuff is stuff from from the 50s on up till i guess you could say around 2000 somewhere around that area so is it these mostly your dad's helmets and is that an aj foyt visor or something that's foyt visor and this was my helmet in 84 85 i think this is my dad's first racing helmet would have been in 1965 this was his helmet in uh, when he was running the Chrysler products, one of them, it was like 73, 74. And then, this was actually my first helmet. And I looked at it. I don't know if I did or he did it, but if you look at the helmet, it's got a long crack and it's been busted. So <laughs> I just think it's a weird thing to think it. Here he wore a helmet two or three years, and then I wore it a couple of years, and it was busted. So I don't know <laughs> when it got busted. If I did, probably more than likely, yeah, I feel pretty sure he would not have given me a busted helmet. So it's probably something I'd have had a crash in and cracked it. And you just, that's, you know, times have just changed, and naturally you wouldn't do things like that. And I was young. You didn't, you know, 
you know, I didn't care if I could drive a race car then, I didn't care if I even got to wear a helmet or not. You just was glad to get to do it. So you didn't even think about things like that. And yeah, just different uh, things. You know, Harry, got a hat from Harry, uh, Ricky Rudd, Hank Thomas, um, Darrell Waltrip, just different ones. Um, Neil Bonnet, Jimmy Spencer, and Bill Blair, Harry Gant, Dick Trickle. So Linda Vaughn, just a lot of different... I don't do it for, you know, people say, what's it worth? I don't have no idea what it's worth. I don't do it for the money or anything. I do it because I love the sport. I love what it what it was. I love being a part of it. And so it's a part of the sport. And it's a part of my dad. And it's a part of me. With the, the shifter? This was uh, from, I run this one right around 77 till 83. And uh, Richard Petty broke a stick shift. I'm trying to say somewhere, um, I don't know, I believe it was about 77 or 8. He had, I'm pretty sure he broke a shifter and he used a screwdriver to change gears. And I think I'm right on that. And we put a, we just took a piece of steel and welded it on to support it but i'm just thinking thing probably weighs a pound and a half <laughs> and now here they are making them out of aluminum well you just didn't you didn't think about a pound here and a pound there and everything and you know most of the time you know the bad thing about we did we were most time mid-pack runners every now and then you'd have a good run where you get up to eighth or tenth for a little bit but most time you know 15th 40th and that's just the way it was i mean uh, you, you, we just you did the best you could do and I always said, you know, the front guys needed somebody to pass. And I was one of those guys that that they passed a lot. And then, uh, you know, Earnhardt, I got uh, people talk about Dale Earnhardt and Dale Jr. I'll just tell you a quick story. In 95 or 6, like I said, we were very successful in the late mile stock division. And we was at Martinsville and Dale Jr. come over. Now, I mean, I knew him, but. You know, he hadn't got to be Dale Jr. then. People didn't really know of him, and he was, he struggled, he tell you, he struggled a lot in the late mall stock division. So he was down Martinsville, and it was about 95, 96, somewhere along there. He come over and said, um, uh, my crew chief said, you get around here pretty good. I said, well, you know, we won, and we've sat on a few poles, so yeah, we do pretty decent. He said, would you follow me for a few laps, and I'll motion you by, and I'll follow you a few laps. Sure, and just tell me what I'm doing. So, so we did that. And, you know, he comes on and we talked about it a little bit. That was the last time, believe it or not, that I have talked to Dale Earnhardt Jr. And I'll tell you the last time I talked to his dad. Around 83, 82. You know, Dale was, you know, I don't know if he'd been, had. I don't guess he'd even become what they call the intimidator at that time. The race after Darlington or the race after Rockingham. He comes up to me and he said, I need to talk to you. There, we was kind of across each other. My toolbox is here. His was on the back side, like maybe a few feet down below mine. Somebody else might have been across, but he was very close. He said, Ron, I need to speak to you. I said, yeah, and he comes around. He said, uh, last week when I come up on you, he said, I passed you two or three times and you crowded me. And I said, I crowded you. He said, yeah, you come up in the corner and you kind of was up the track. I mean, I said, Dad, you give you an inch, you take a mile. And he said, no, you was crowding me. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. From here on out, I said, the track's two lanes wide. I'll run on the apron half a lane. That gives you a lane and a half. That should give you plenty of racing room. He looked at me and he walked out and he never spoke to me again. <laughs> so he just, you know, I thought it was kind of funny, but he didn't appreciate it, I don't think. But that's the last time I talked to <laughs> his dad. But, you know, people knew Earnhardt. He was... Hey, you liked him or not, you couldn't take it away from him. I mean, the man was tough. This is uh, probably one of the neater pieces I've got. Um, this is Richard's uniform from 70 when he ran the Roadrunner and the Superbird. And this is Darlington in 70. This is when they used to run, I never ran it, my dad ran the circuit when they used to run like 50 race year. And this is Malta, New York, July of 70. And same uniform it's he give it to my dad at the end of the 70 races my dad bought a couple cars off richard when he quit 
he quit for, uh, Chrysler in 68. He went to Ford in 69. My dad bought the Plymouth, and at the end of 70, my dad got to be good friends with, with the bunch, so he gave my dad the uniform at the end of the, end of the year, so I got Richard to authenticate it and this and that, and uh, strange thing about this, this is the one he ran, and I, I don't know how many Plymouth Roadrunner uniforms. I mean, it's got the, you know, it's got the Superbird patch on it. Uh, I don't feel like there's very many of these would be around. No, I mean, it's not like they were getting a new one every weekend no, back then. But here's the odd thing about this. This uniform in 73, I think, this uniform was wore in this movie. If you ever seen the movie, The Last American Hero with Jeff Bridges. Yeah. This uniform was wore in the movie, and this is the car it was worn in. This is the guy I was driving. This was my dad's crew chief, Jimmy Cox. And he lives in North Carolina now. Jimmy's 76 years old. He kept the cars up pretty well for about, probably about six or seven years. He was pretty well almost a one-man operation. He kept the cars up, and you know what little help he could get to help on the cars. But Jimmy wore it, and he wore, drove the second Plymouth. Um, they had two of them. And what you would do back then, you would take two cars, a lot of times you would take the second car, Jimmy or somebody would get in it and they'd make three or four or five laps, park the car and get the hundred bucks or whatever it was starting money. Take a trailer to the track, it just technically, you know, don't sound like much, but it was a lot then, it give them extra money. And a lot of, several of the guys did this. So, Jim, I don't know how many laps he drove it during the race. So it's got a little history, it's Richard's uniform and it was worn in the last American Hero movie. So. Pretty neat little uniform. Here's the funny thing. My dad gave $25 for this, which was, you know, in 58 or 57, 25 bucks is a pretty good little chunk of change. It's probably like 500 bucks now. Yeah, probably. Here, here's the funny thing. This is when I won the late model stock car race at Martinsville Speedway in 89. Everybody was running power steering and we come up these cars now they've got these things from what I understand are running 500 horsepower or maybe I don't know maybe five feet I don't know exactly but I know they're running around 500 horsepower anyway when we was running them you know they were 340 350 you know stuff along in there so we got this little idea said we got took the power steering pump off and maybe saved a few horsepower when you're that low so I went over to Glenn and Leonard's and I bought this off Leonard. They had signed it, Glenn Leonard, but the oil, I didn't get the oil off of it. Their name is kind of fade out, but this is a 16 to one ratio Ford steering box. So Leonard, who I'll run this, he said, well, it's probably, he said, I can just tell you, it's probably David Pearson, Donnie, Buddy Baker, he said, it could be all of them or one of them. He said, we kind of run the same steering box. I can't tell you 100% sure if all of them run it, but more than likely, one or two of them run it. It could be all of them. I give that, bought this, never even thought about it. I give Leonard $25 for that steering box. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, how many years later, I had to be over there. And you know, this has been put up in my dad's house for the, ever. And you know, when I did all this, he said, you need to put this over there. So 10 or 15 years ago, whatever, you know, I put all, put all this stuff together and brought it over here. I just think it's kind of a, a neat thing to think. I paid the same thing that many years later than what my dad, for, dad did for a piece that much earlier. <laughs> so if you're gonna try to buy something from the Wood Brothers, 25 bucks is a, is a good, maybe that'd be a good starting offer today. Uh, you ain't gonna get nothing from the Woods Brothers for $25. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they don't, uh, you know, they're, these people now, and no disrespect, you know, so many of these people now, you know, they don't, uh, you're not going to get much give to you anymore. People have realized what stuff is worth. And to be honest with you, 15, 20 years ago, I had more than this. We'd give some pieces away. This is a door off of my dad's car in 65. This was at um, Bristol. And a guy by the name of John Kraft that restores home and moody cars 
restored my dad's old car. Of course, my dad didn't own it, then somebody else. John bought it, and then he he was supposedly sold it or it got in a flood or something, but he kept the door piece in it to me. And this car here to the left, that is the, the car my dad and his partner, Don Robson, out of Roanoke, Virginia, bought this car, and this is the petty black top they called not a black top but the Plymouth that was at Dayton in 68 it was the blue Plymouth that had the black crinkle finish paint or whatever kind of paint they had on it that's the car when he went to Ford in 69 my dad bought this car my dad and Don his partner purchased this car and it was race ready when he got it this is Cal Yarborough's door this is from 1969 and it was from Texas and he crashed it and I don't know if he cracked his shoulder or broke it but when I went down and spent some time with him here a couple years ago he told me and I think he said he actually cracked his shoulder but it says on here broken so I would have it, it's typed in what it is so he didn't break his shoulder blade but I went took it down there and got him to sign it he looked at it and I told him where it was and Kale said, yeah, man, my shoulder still hurts from that. <laughs> I just thought, so then got uh, a little while later, got Leonard Wood to sign it. So, you know, a little history there, the Woods brothers, and I just thought a lot of people don't get to see this. I mean, this is the inside of the doors, and you see where the roll-up windows were it's the whole door not just the skin yeah and i mean this thing weighs about 50 pounds how did you get this uh a guy that's friends with me that worked for the woods brothers had it for uh about 45 years and it's been in his garage and i got it from him huh. so he's just getting older and his family didn't want, want it so Actually, what we did, we did a little bit of trading. So I got something from him I wanted, and he got something from him he needed. Okay, this is a piece here that come off of Dale Earnhardt's car from Richmond in February of 86. And that is from the race where Darrell Waltrip and Earnhardt wrecked, and Kyle Petty won his first race <laughs> with at Richmond, and um, pretty famous wreck, but Got a picture of Earnhardt signing it in his living room in Mooresville. And I took it here about, I don't know, at the Winston Cup Museum uh, probably a year ago and got uh, Kurt to sign it. You don't have to know a whole lot about racing to know that sponsors keep race cars on the track and these videos are no different. Today's video sponsor is PDS Debt. Maybe they can help you. You know, not just with financial stuff, but anything when it's, you got a bunch of stuff overwhelming you, it helps a lot to have a resource to help you put the plan together and take action one bite at a time. PDS Debt can help you do that. PDS Debt has customized options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances are not going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt provides options that consolidate your debts into one low monthly payment. Everyone with $10,000 or more in eligible debt qualifies and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit accepted. Save thousands on interest and fees, pay off your debt in a fraction of the time. PDS Debt is offering free debt analysis. It only takes 30 seconds. Go to pdsdebt.com stapleton to get your free debt assessment today. There's a, there's a lot it's a lot yeah. in here i can't even it's like the more like you can pick one spot to look at something you're like oh that's cool and you see the thing next to it and behind it and in front of it and below it and above it and it just is like it's like a where's waldo of really interesting stuff pretty well mainly cup a few bush pieces and a select few um late mall stock pieces from what is that box intake from this is called a, a bathtub it's a hemi bathtub intake off 426 hemi that's what they ran from ugh, i can't i'm not gonna say exactly but probably somewhere around 67 maybe somewhere along there 68 
and do you I, know what car that came off of? I, I do. I've heard it come from Cotton Owens. I got paperwork and some stuff from Cotton Owens Garage, but you know, people will. The one thing I don't like about this business is I try to be truthful about everything. You know, some people say, "Oh, they come off of Richard Petty's car." Or this. From what I understand, I got some stuff from Cotton Owens. A guy told me it come from Cotton Owens Garage. I can't, I don't know if it did or not, but it's a, a Hemi bathtub intake, and this is a 1050 Dominator carburetor. That's what they ran on them back then in the 69. Ford got, Ford got them first, and then Ford ran them for, I don't know, a few races, and then, you know, the Chrysler's, Got to run them after that. It's like a Neil Bonnet action figure. I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I don't even, you know the truth, I don't even know where some of this stuff came from. I don't even, you know, some of the stuff, lots of pieces I've saved, lots of pieces my dad saved, but yeah, I just, I don't even know where some of the stuff you don't know the truth. I don't even know where some of the stuff exactly came from. So I got too much stuff piled up. You don't know the truth. <laughs> the late model was, you know, made us a name where we could be proud of. But the thing about it is you can run in mid pack or back of the pack in cup and you'll get more out of it, milk more out of it than you will. You can win all the late model stock rates you want. And it aggravates me cause I go around to all these functions now and get togethers and there'll be, you know, dozens of people. Yeah, I remember your dad. I remember you won Rookie of the Year and this and that. There'll be, if it's a hundred people, there'll be one or two said, yeah, I used to watch you and run late mile stock. You may not want in cup, but you kick some butt in late mile stock, but there's very few. So it's just, I always say it's a lot of people in, in the late mile stock division, other divisions too, but people in late mile stock, they can make heck of a drivers if they was in cup. But you know, so many of them, you know, they don't have the finances, they don't have the connections, so they'll never get the opportunity. That's just the way it is. Yeah, and you have to be a puppet for whoever you're driving for also. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, it, that's what I don't like about it is all the, you know, kiss and butt stuff, but you know what? You're making 10, 20 million dollars a year, I guess you could stoop down to kiss butt then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all you gotta do is two or three years and you're kinda set for life. So I guess on that uh you know, with that given you could probably stand it a little bit easier. Yeah. Where's the where does the that come from? That come off uh Bobby Allison when he drove for the Stavolo brothers. How'd you end up with it? Um is that one of those pieces you don't know? <laughs> it, I can't remember. I, for some reason, I cannot remember. But it, yeah, it's just, that's what everybody used to run back then. That's kind of the the go-to piece. Everybody said, how come Bobby didn't stay with Junior and this and that? I mean, I remember back then, I, you know, I raced with all them guys. I, I just always thought Bobby liked to do things his way. Mm -hmm. Junior liked to do things his way. Herb Nab like to do things his way, and I just think they clashed. I feel like that, everybody really had a complex back then. Like they didn't want to hear one guy's way of setting it up because their way was the best they way. They had their way. It was like I don't know, like a pissing contest. It seems yeah. like <laughs> that's what it mounted to. It seems like some people would rather lose and be right than use someone else's idea and win and admit to not having the idea themselves. Or you know, a lot of ideals got stole back then. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a funny one. People remember when um, Neil Bonnet and Darrell Waltrip had the number 11, 12 Budweiser. Well, we was at Darlington, I can't remember. They would close the, uh, I'm trying to say the garage down like 12 to 12.30 that for like a lunch break, somewhere along that area. People around back then used to be around garages will remember. So I had a boy with me and the crew hadn't come down. A lot of times be myself, maybe one, two other guys. It used to be about three of us come in on Thursday or Friday, and then Saturday, everybody would get out. You know, you wouldn't pay anybody. All the guys that worked around here, you know, at grocery stores and Ford dealership and uh, 
they would all show up on Saturdays when they was off work as an average. So I told a guy, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in under, I don't remember if it was Neil's car or Daryl's car, but I said, I'm gonna get in under it and I'm gonna look what kind of springs and what angle they got their trailing arms and they got wedge blocks in and, and I'm gonna read their shocks. That's when you run these Monroe shocks and you'd run like, you'd run like 80, 83s and uh, 85s, 87s and 88s, 77s, stuff like that. And I said, I'll just get under. I said, you look around. Wasn't nobody out that side of the garage. I said, you just look around make sure, you know, none of the crew guys, Junior or Neil or none of them comes around. Okay. I said, you see them coming holler and I'll roll out and walk <laughs> on down. Okay. Walk down the, the stalls there. Okay. I was in on the car looking at this. I was taking little notes on springs, mental notes. All of a sudden, I'm standing there and I seen this B-U-D. I said, what the heck? I said, oh, crap. It's Budweiser uniform. <laughs> I don't, yeah, you know, I seen it written on the pants. And I went, oh, crap. I just laid here and I said, I'll just lay here. Maybe they'll walk off. And it was the funniest thing. And I've seen this guy since then, talked to him twice. And when I told him, I said, I remember you catch me doing something. He said, I know exactly what I caught you at Darlington in under the car. And it was Tim Brewer. Mm -hmm. And he looked down. And then you could see I had to, I was about to break out in a sweat. He looked down like that. And he said, don't let the car fall on you, Ronnie. <laughs> and I said, well, I just wanted to see one thing. He said, yeah, sure. And I rolled out. And I told the guy with me, he was sitting there looking around lollygagging. I walked off. I said, I appreciate you look, being a good lookout for me. And he said, Darren, I got to wandering off. He did. He was down about 40 or 50 foot. He wasn't even looking. And anyway, <laughs> but I'm just saying, can you imagine what would happen somebody doing that now in a cup garage? Yeah. You'd probably get thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just, you know, we was no, you know, well as I do, we weren't no competition junior johnson or daryl or you know richard petty they knew that but they still didn't want you to see certain things they was doing hmm. now you might figure see something they're doing pick up a half a tenth or a few hundreds and that's what i was looking for i was looking for little things but you're you were so far behind you know you're 20 horsepower 25 horsepower short on engines they had new tires we had tires from a race or two before you got a car that's a year or two behind theirs on technology so it's no way earthly way you're going to run with them guys and there would be times we go to bristol somewhere and we'd hit up on with something maybe during a race for 50 laps you could follow them guys but that was that was your little claim to fame that you know you went to 30 races a year and say hey we got to for you know 50 laps we got to run even though you four or five laps down you get to run with the you know, third, fourth, fifth place car, you get to fall them for 20, 30 laps. And that was occasionally. And that would just, that would kind of make you day or year or whatever. And it was, you know, a lot of people said, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. But if I wanted to race, I had to do it that way. We had no choice. And I wasn't alone. And there's a lot of guys in the same shape. You know, there's a lot of guys worse off than me. You know, we had a little something. Some people didn't have anything. So just was lucky enough to be a part of it. This is North Wilkesboro in 92. This is my first win, technically, in 88. And this is Pulaski County Speedway in late mile stock. And what happened was, in Cup, we struggled. And everybody, pretty well, everybody liked you. You know, you wasn't going to go driver introduction and go across the stage. You know, back then, you know, it wasn't nothing to have 50 or 100,000 people to racetrack, 150,000. There was packed crowds back then. You know, you go there and say Richard Petty, some of them, they're going to have their 30,000 people. You know, people like me, you'd have, you know, you'd have three or 400 true fans, and then you have other, you know, maybe 5,000. I think they cheered for you just because they felt sorry for you, but <laughs> they, you'd have that handful of cheering for you. So what happened, we got out of Lake Mall. I mean, out of Cup, we went to Lake Mall. And so we go up there and win. You know, we had a lot of people cheering for us. We go to Wilkesboro and run. If we didn't, you know, we was pretty well a top five car. We go to uh, Kingsport. We go to Coburn. We was always up front as an average. Well, after a couple years, first thing you know, I'm getting out and I'm starting to get booze. And I'm like, what I, What the heck did I do? 
and you know, and then, you know, my dad would be the still. My dad said, eh, you're seeing the other side of it. You're winning now. People don't like seeing you. You know, we was going and running 30, 35 race a year. We was winning half of them in a lot of places. So people don't like seeing the same person win a lot. Mm -hmm. So what happened is I started getting booed and the finger and all, and I would get, you know, getting stuff like this in the mail. They wouldn't have a... <laughs> They wouldn't have a return address. They put Ronnie Thomas Racing Fan Club. This would have been about '93, Chrisburg, Virginia. You know, they put all. They just put. Ah, uh, they put. What does it say? It says. <laughs> From a senior citizen that has had enough of your diarrhea mail. And yeah. That, that did they mail you the the poop or was yeah, that? Yeah, they mailed the poop. <laughs> so they would be, and then you, I'd get stuff like. I'd get stuff like this in the mail, you know, it said, it said, uh, when things go wrong, as they usually will, and your daily road seems all uphill, when funds are low and debts are high, when you try to smile but can only cry and you feel you'd like to quit, don't come to me, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> one lap down and give me, Give me a Mickey Mouse finger. This is when <laughs> wow. we were winning, and I was getting this stuff in the mail, and I would get stuff like, you know, just crazy stuff like a, you know, Pee Wee Herman yo-yo, you know, and I'm like, what the heck? You know, they get up there, and people get up there and say, you sound like Pee Wee Herman. You sound like Gomer Pyle. Oh, my <laughs> people, gosh. Well, hey, I can handle it. I do have a bad country accent, but I get this, Gomer. and then, you know, and then I got, you know, somebody sent me a poop in the mail, and then, <laughs> then I got I got a um, pacifier in the mail, and this was all like it. You know, it didn't really start till eighty eight, eighty nine, went to ninety. But after I'd done it about three years, four years, we started to win a lot. But then I started getting from ninety two, ninety three on up till ninety six, ninety seven. Now ninety six. We started cutting back. We was only running about, go went from running like 30 races to about 10, 10 or 12 races. So we were just going to like 200 lap shows. And I was kind of getting to the point where I'm like, I'm kind of thinking about getting out of it. So we went up here in 99, September, the last race, and had a 200 lap, and we had a bunch of big names come in. Uh, we started last. NASCAR said, you're sucking air to the front. I, said we had a little aluminum piece pulled down from the radiator had two barrels in and they had a piece they said that i said well that got knocked up a couple of weeks ago in a race and they said so that thing got pushed all the way down even all the way across the grill and i said yeah he said push it up and put some rivets in it and you're gonna start in the rear and there's like 27 cars there and i said okay so we fixed it. it's 200 lap race we won the race and i got out and the next week after that was Martinsville and I told the guys I said I want to thank all y'all a year some of them helped me for two or three years some of them been with me for 20 years I said I want to thank all of you all for helping me but after Martinsville I'm hanging it up I'm selling out and that's what I did I sold all you know a month or two after that I sold my shop I sold you know my car and truck trailer my equipment and everything and got out of it so it just it was funny that you know, you're in cup and you're struggling and you get feel people feel sorry for you. I wish you'd get a sponsor. I wish you get this. To go into a late model and, you know, the thing about the late model, we was spending about maybe a fourth of what we was spending in in the um, cup series. So it was a lot easier on us financially. And actually, I could get people to help me in late model. I, I, you had a hard time getting sponsors in cup but when i want to run late model people's jumping and they want to help you when you're up front even though it's late model but yeah this was a lot of fun all this stuff and my wife would say why are you leaving this stuff around you know, <laughs> but i think it's kind of a fun story it is know? i'm glad it's there yeah. I was laughing to myself when you were telling that story about Tim Brewer coming up and scaring you. I was like, oh my gosh, he probably pulled this out of his pants after Tim came up. <laughs> you bet. I felt about it, that with Tim, what it meant to, it it embarrassed me so bad. I'm like, God, I mean, you know, it's bad enough you're doing it, but it's worse when you get caught. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, and just, 
you know, this was, I went down a couple years ago and talked to Kale, spent about two hours with him. I went to get, he signed the flag. This is his flag. He'd come out of, uh, of course, Junior and Flossie split up years before that, but when she passed away, she had a bunch of stuff, of, more stuff of this in boxes. I guess he left there. Not when he left there, but I guess he, he left his stuff there. So I got Kale. This is the uh, the flag from 1980. He had one with, I got him signing it. And here's the funny thing is I got a few of these and Kale signed it. And he said, boy, that was a guy. was at Richmond. He said, boy, that was a good day. And I said, hey, did you notice whose mailing address is on it? And he looked, he said, man. So I just thought it's funny. It's Kale had signed it. Junior Johnson, Rhonda, North Carolina. <laughs> so just, th this is the kind of stuff that really kind of, that I really love. It's a little history stuff like that. Yeah, that's you cool. Know, that's, that's the kind know, of stuff that's hard to survive. Well, a lot of it got thrown away. Yeah. Who would think to keep it? I spent, to be honest with you, about 10 years just hanging, displaying, out in the garage, putting stuff together. I'm glad I did it, but it's to the thing now, here I am getting ready to turn 69, have no children, and I'm kind of the point I'm thinking, what am I going to do with it? And that's where I'm getting to the point. You know, there's actually people come up and say, you need to sell this stuff now. And I said, well, I'm not ready to sell it, but I still go back to what I told you earlier. I think five to 10 years of shelf life, you know, a lot of this stuff, it, it's going to drop fast in value. And a lot of people get aggravated me saying it because I think the glory days of NASCAR is getting fast behind us. I just feel like the stuff that we all loved and uh, <clears throat> a lot of these guys liked and did, it's it's kind of getting it's it's kind of getting to the other side of it. I mean, I used to never miss it when I quit racing. You know, I went to a few Cup races now. I don't ever go to one now. I wish them luck. Uh, I don't wish. I, I run into so many people my age and older. And they're like, well, NASCAR sucks, and I hope this. I hope. I'd still like to see the sport do good and survive. But I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't. Some of the things NASCAR has done has been good, but some you, you're never gonna agree with everything. But they've done some things that's to me screwed up the sport. I mean, I don't understand the one lug nut. I mean, street cars are not running one lug nut. I don't. Yeah. You know. The Toyotas and the Fords, they're not running one lug nuts. So I don't understand them doing that, but you know, what it amounts to, I don't really feel they care what people in my age group or older, even people in their maybe in their later fifties, I don't kinda really don't feel like NASCAR cares about our thought. Now that's my feelings and I might be wrong in saying that and they might disagree with me. This is Benny Parsons pedals. Yeah, that's a car I bought from him. I total lost it, and we stripped it down, and I kept the pedal. That's the only thing I got out of the pedals that come out of his car in uh, 77, 78, somewhere along in there. Why are they so bent up? That's why people would bend them to, you know, the clutch on the left and pedal on the right. And, and actually, when I got it, I been, I'm a right-footed breaker. I don't know what Benny was, but actually bent them, took the torch, and we heat them and pull them a little bit more to the left. And you just kind of, you don't have as far to drag your foot to the right. And that's another thing, you know, from what I understand, Don Ellis was telling me here a while back, we was at a get together. And I think, um, I can't remember if, if Donnie told me he was right or left footed, but I think Richard Petty, I think Dale Emmett told me Richard was a right footed breaker. And I believe Don, a lot of people were right-footed and a lot of people didn't like it because they, you know, you, you got this time going from your right foot to the brake. You, you know, you're on right-footed, you're on from here, pedal, gas pedal to the brake, gas pedal brake. So to me, it would probably been better if I would have taught myself to be a left-footed breaker because, you know, you're doing this. You're not, you know, I'm going like this they're, you know, they're going like this. So probably I think that's one thing that hurt me. And I think now 
<coughs> you would probably almost have to be able. I don't know if anybody is a right-footed breaker now. They're running so much deeper in the corner and the cars are so much faster that I, I don't know if you could even be a right-footed breaker now and still be competitive. The most recent guy I know of that was still a right-foot breaker was Bobby Labonte. There may be somebody later than that, but I know that Bobby was because he talked about when he went to go drive the modified, he couldn't, and he had to figure out how to use his left foot because yeah. of the way the footwell was. And he was like, dang, I should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I'm like, I think like him, I think it would be better. My dad tried to get me to do it in the late 70s, but I've been doing it so long, I just couldn't put it in my mind to to uh, to make the deal. But That's yeah. interesting because we, uh, we were at Dave Marcus's a couple weeks ago. And after we were done filming, I was asking him about that because he said he was a, a right foot breaker too. Oh, really? Yeah. That's what I say. It was what I understand. A lot of people were right footed breakers back then. Huh. You know, you had so much. You figure you wasn't hauling off way deep in the corner like now. They've got the tire so good, the spoilers, the way they got so much down force on the car and the technology on the suspension and shocks and all. You know, they can haul these cars on off in the corners now. So you know, you're driving way off down in there. And you're kind of getting off of it, and you list them. They're not off of it for, like, we go off, and you'd be off of it maybe a, a second or two. Now they're probably off of it a half a second or something. So I think it would be harder to be competitive now being a right-footed breaker. I mean, I don't know. I don't hear the question. I've often wondered how many people now are right-footed breakers. I'd say the majority of them are left-footed breakers. You know, it's interesting. Uh, there was that old, about Benny Parsons, there was that old book that was like, uh, stock car driving basics or whatever yeah i got one on ebay and i was just looking at it a couple of weeks ago and there was a picture in there of where to put your feet and it was benny in his car with his feet and i want to look at that and see if those are the same pedals because it could be the yeah. same era you have to look and see if it's the same yeah you have to look and see if they're bent like that now like i said we bent we did a little bit you know we would get the torch in our bendies but i'm that don't look like our welding i mean we welded but you can tell that's probably like a Travis Carter or somebody back then. It was his crew guy that would have did that. Our welding one, you know, we did okay, but we did the best we could. But we, you know, nobody back had helped our bunch. Everybody, you know, that helped me, they worked at grocery stores. You know, they were on the police department. They worked at the Ford garage. So they weren't pro fabricators. They was, they did the, I won't say they weren't pro. I had, I had two guys with me that could have actually went to work for a cup team and they wouldn't do it because their theory was, and they're right, I quit my job, I go to work for a cup team, it lobbed a fold in a year or two or three. Mm -hmm. You know, everything in racing is so short-lived. So a lot of these guys, you know, they stayed at a factory 30, 40 years. Now they got a pretty good ink, you know, I got a decent check coming in every month. I just noticed this here talking about the Herb Nabs. Uh, yeah, that Herb Nabs jacket. Yes. From Rainier. Uh, that would be. Uh, that looks like Rainier. Yeah, that looks like 1980-ish, 79, 80, Some something like that. Yeah, that's I, cool. Yeah, same 9, 80, 81, somewhere along in there. That is awesome. It looked like, yeah, like you said, the uh, Teflon or whatever it was called. Tough, tough lawn, I yeah, think. Yeah, tough lawn. It looked like around that area and. Uh, Maybe the um, 28 car. Yeah, the Grey Ghost era. Yeah, yeah. it's was right along in there. Like I said, I don't even, you don't know the truth? I don't even, I can't remember some of the stuff. My buddy in North Carolina had this, and he said, I got something I want to give you, and he gave this to me. Wow. And I just thought I had to think where stuff, you know, you got all this stuff, and you got to start thinking about how you got it, where it come from. Like I said, probably 80% of the stuff is stuff that we had and some of the stuff I've traded for, a few things I've accumulated, but I don't need to accumulate anything else. I, <laughs> yeah. I don't have any room for anything else. I was about to say, maybe you should like uh, put one of those like little stickers on the, the bottom and label it. <laughs> where, I don't, where I don't forget. I this something. isn't even the only one on the hook. What's underneath it? That's one of my old racing jackets. Okay. Oh, is it like this one? No, it's uh, DBJ. I, like I said, I've got so much stuff, I had to cover stuff up. <laughs> I, it's seriously, I just got, I've got too much stuff. If you get too well, much, you know, cool if you can have too to much have. stuff. You got, you got, this is like a, we've been in museums that did not have Maybe. this density of interesting stuff. Davey Ellison. Wow, that's awesome. That's like so cool. Davey, this Earnhardt hat, Jeff Bodine, Donnie, 
This is a good hat. This is the Blue Max, one Tim Richmond drove for Raymond Beetle. Huh. This is a neat postcard. Got both of them. It's Curtis Turner, one in 65 when he drove for the Woods Brothers. There's, you can see, I can't. Curtis it's got Turner. the 1965, I think, is the post date on it. 66. 66. So I just thought this, and this come, this guy passed away and it come out of his collection. I got a, I like Joe Namath's kid, so I got a helmet he signed. This is a thing Rick Houston did, and I didn't know it was when I told about it. I told him about bringing out a caution flag and getting paid a thousand dollars by Gary Nelson to, I get, I think it was Bobby Allison. I got to look and see when they needed a caution flag and I spun out to bring them a flag out. You did that on purpose to get paid? Oh, uh, you had to do it. Well, I mean, you know, I think <laughs> if I finished 10th, I got $1,200. So, you know, I got, I didn't. It can yeah. guarantee hey, you almost top 10 payout just spin out real quick. You're running 25th, 30th, what's it matter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's I great. mean, it ain't like you're running to win a race. So we did what we had to do. Did that help Bobby win the championship in 83? I'd, I got, yeah, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that was when he won. I got to look and see. And we done got to where we won run about eight or nine races a year in a 85, 86. It was out that we were struggling and just didn't have the money to do it at all. So we went to Wilkesboro and made a show and Buddy Arrington missed the show. And he said, I'll give you $500, that's what I got. He he said, I need to start to race, give you 500 bucks to give him starting points. Uh, so. Cause he was on, was he on the deal money? He was on the deal. We done fell off of it. Okay. So actually I told him, he said, I'll just run to the first caution. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, just run the whole race if you want to. I just stand here and watch and he used me, you know, I don't even remember. He pulled in, he got out and I got in the car or whatever, but <clears throat> that was what the deal was. <laughs> so, but it's just, this is, this guy here, you, you want to have, a hundred different people say this guy needs to be in the Hall of Fame. That guy needs to be in the Hall of Fame. This driver needs to be in the Hall of Fame. This is one guy that does need to be in the Hall of Fame. And it's Ray Hendricks. And his son is Roy. And they from up near the, I guess, Richmond. And that was a trophy his son gave me. That's from North Wilkesboro Hickory. It was some kind of a dual race that he won. And uh, got a trophy for winning. But... Ray's won 650 or 700 modified races. I, I do not understand how, I know it's a voting committee. Nobody's gonna be happy with this guy or that guy winning, I mean, getting in or not getting in. But you gotta wonder how some of these people that have won seven, 800, Dick Trickle won a thousand races. Mm -hmm. What do, you know, I'm trying to think, what determines who gets in, who don't like Smokey Eunuch? Mm -hmm. People raising cane. I don't smoke a unit get in. You know, my feelings, he should be in. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, an innovator. I mean. Were you, were you there when they tore down Smokey's shop? I got, or? I got this a few years back. Uh, it was in the ground and a couple of friends with me, were best three or four of us down there a couple of years ago. And it was sticking up out of the ground. I dug it out of the ground and a NASCAR historian happened to be with us. And he said that was Pretty sure it's either, didn't think it was the wall, said it was the floor because it was a greenish color. So, you know, I pulled it up off the ground. It was actually a bigger chunk and I broke it half in two and gave it to a friend. We just wrote this on there so we'd kind of know where it come from. These are some neat pieces and you'll see these around. If you look at people back in the 60s, 70s and 80s on Pitt Waller, you'll see them, they holding these things. This yeah. is my dad's stopwatches from 65 Till he quit going in the 90s. What's the bone from? Ah, it's just a kind of a joke. My dad used to be a character. My dad used to joke all the time around the garage area, and he would stick chicken bones in people's pockets. I don't, just, <laughs> you know, and they go around and they, you know, like, where'd that come from? This guy <laughs> gave this to me about seven or eight years ago, and he said, I got something for you. And that's what he said, we was at a get together. And I went to go out in the car and I went to get my car key. I said, what the heck? He pulled it out and he said, what the heck? And he said, as soon as I know, he said, your dad had stuck a chicken bone in my pocket. <laughs> and he said, the next time I saw him, I got him to sign it. That's hilarious. So my dad signed it. So he'd had all these years and he said, well, I'm gonna give it to you. I've had it. So it's just kind of a funny thing. My dad, you know, people like that, my dad and all, 
those days are gone as far as the joking and it's corporate now, it's all business and, you know, that's well and good, but, you know, all the fun stuff is, you hear the guys in it now, they said, you know, it ain't a lot of joking around and carrying on and like it used to be. So I think that part of the race and it's bad, it's gone away, but, you know, like I said, they could care less what I, you know, what I think NASCAR care less and that's fine. I'll show you this. And it's a, a little viewer and you pick it up and it's, you know, you can see like a, you know, might be a bridge, a car, a scenery. You pick it up and it's, a, you hold it up the light and it's a view, a little view master. So, and we had a service station down here and I'd hang around it all the, right down the street here. It's tore down now, but my dad said, called from, it was either California or when they went on a Northern trip up to New England States racing, Trent and them areas. My dad said, I was about 12, 13, 14. My dad said, boy, I got you something. You're going to really, just show you how funny my dad was about things. He said, when you go to school, you're going to fix those kids up. You're going to have something nobody else got what. He said, I got you a little TV. You take to school. And he said, have me pick up a TV and watch at school. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, nah, a couple inches tall. Now, of course, people got phones now and all. So the young people wouldn't even know what I'm talking about now, but this is back when, <clears throat> you know, when you had a TV back then, our first TV was like a 14, 13 inch TV. You didn't have no TVs that, you didn't see them all these places now. The only time place you'd have a TV, mate, would be at home. <laughs> when Steve Bank brings this thing to me and it got in, I said, hey, give me one. I said, where's that TV? Now I'll give it to you in a little bit. And he kept on making me wait. He gave that darn thing to me, and I picked one and I looked up, and his little viewfinder had a picture of a house. So, <laughs> that's just the type of person my dad was. <laughs> it's it funny as all. He just had this little comical side to him. But I want to tell you, this Dr. Pepper bottle here, when I got the steering box, the manual steering box from Leonard, it was hot that day, and he said they had a mach pop machine in there. This is after not the shop, the old shop down in Stewart. The one by the river? Yeah. Come on over. I'm here. So I went over there. Of course, gave me $25. You want some something drink? I said, yeah, what do you want? I'll take a Dr. Pepper. He gave it to me, and I said, don't open it. And he said, what? And I said, I'll tell you one thing. Day Leonard Wood gives me something. I'm not going to open it. Yeah. And I've kept that. And he laughed about that then. <laughs> but I've kept that Dr. Pepper <laughs> from when Leonard gave that thing, whenever it was, the date he gave that to me. But it's just you know things have saved over the year jd mcduff this is a neat piece here this is uh what is that uh february of 90 and i think jd if i'm not mistaken didn't he lose his life in 91 jd yeah. mcduff he's somewhere along there 91 so i'm thinking that check right there is not you think maybe a year year and a half you know the man's gone, I'm thinking. Well, so I got a hat he'd sign, check he'd sign. This is Herb Nabb's hat. You know, this is a neat piece. Kenny Schrader, when he stopped here two or three months ago, of course, he drove for Juni. In 19, early 80s, we used to check our wedge. And <clears throat> when I say wedge, <laughs> we didn't have scales to 82, 83. You used to take a socket and put on, a, put on your jack or jack on the plate and you get in under there and you get in the center of your and you jack it up and and when you left rear tire would get where it'd get off the ground say if it was six and a half inches the other side if you measure from the rim to the ground might be seven and a half that meant you had an inch of wedge so if you want the car you know tighter you're going to make that distance greater on the right side you're going to put more wedge if you want the car freed up you want to run that screw jack down or loosen the left one up and that number's going to get you know smaller so I was jacking the carp, checking the wedge, and Junior come over and he said, Ryan, I got something I'm gonna give you. I said, what? I went and he said, come here. So one of his toolbox, he said, here's my old one. He had a new one and it's still got a lot of these blue paint on it, you can see, but Junior Donnelly to give that to me, I guess about 82, 83. And so it's what he'd used on his 90 car. And I just thought, you know, you put a value on thing. If somebody come up to me right now and said, I'll give you $300 for it. I wouldn't sell it because 
Junior Donnelly did so much for the sport and had so many drivers in his car. Another guy should go in the Hall of Fame. I don't know if he'll ever get in, but such a nice guy. And what's funny, it's been in my toolbox the whole time. And I was out there looking through it about a year or two ago, and I said, man, can't believe I ain't put that in there. There's two or three pieces in here. I found my toolbox a while back, and I forgot. You know, I found it in there just like that piece. I said, I don't need to be in a toolbox. That needs to be in here. <laughs> so it meant a lot to me because of uh, Junie gave it to me. So, you know, it's like I say, the little things mean a lot, and that means a lot to me. This is Buddy Baker's trophy from Atlanta in 79. This is Bobby's trophy from uh, 72 Dixie 500 Atlanta. And I don't know if you got too much reflection on there or not, but it's Bobby, his mother, and Judy. It's um, Junior, Robert Yates, Herb, um, Bobby's dad, and this is a uh, Oh, golly. I, I think his name's Chuck Looney. I'm not sure. I might be wrong on the name. I remember him. Uh, I know his name. I can't think of it right now, but I remember all these people. You just, you know, as time goes by, you forget names. I might be wrong on Chuck, but I think I'm right. This is, was it been in my toolbox since mid-80s. It's Banjo Matthews Snap-on Ranch. I went down there and they put a clip on my car in the 80s. Put a clip on my car, 82, 83. I got back and I said, I told Marshall, he was creechy. I said, the heck, it's Banjo's wrench. <laughs> so for some reason, that I just, I never did it. Did I steal it? I just kept his in the toolbox and he never did ask about it. And I never did, uh, I just ended up, keeping it all this time so it's a good thing it did because i don't know where banjo's tools ended up Ooh, otherwise that's what I'm saying. this one's still here this is a neat one in 80 when ray everham was with the irock series i was down at it was uh well whenever the run 83 84 i said ray you got a quarter inch ratchet i ate i was doing something on a carburetor or something i said I got the socket, I can't find my doggone ratchet. And he said, okay, I got one. So he come over and had to, as when Jay Signori, whatever his name was, you know, it was over. They was there and he said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll bring it back to you. So I do my stuff and you know, time goes by. And then we go out and run a few last practice, come back and days going by, I rock got their thing done. They were loading up and I seen the trucks leaving. And I see Ray and I said, hey, Ray, hold on. I got, let me go get your ratchet. So what? And I said, your ratchet? He said, just keep it. I said, I got, let me go get it. He said, just keep it, Ronnie. I've had that ratchet ever since then. So I mean. That's awesome. Well. It's cool. Like you don't see, this is the kind of things. There needs to be more stuff like this in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Because you walk around there and yeah, there's some cars and there's murals and stuff. But like, it's Banjo Matthews wrench. I've never seen Banjo Matthews tools before. There's probably some kid in Kentucky putting lift kits on a Silverado with a wrench that says Banjo on it. He doesn't know where it came from. It could get thrown away. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> so, you know, I got a Banjo Matthews wrench and, you know, technically I probably got about two or $3,000 in that wrench. Well, I was yeah. like uh, at SRI when I got those vice grip clamps that somebody custom made at, at Roush Racing. It has Roush Racing engraved on it. It's vice grip clamps that somebody welded um, like new like prongs onto to like hold a bar. And I got it for like, what, $2, $5, something yeah. like that. Yeah, but it means a lot to you. Yeah, I'm like that's cool. See, I'm like you, <laughs> but you know, there's not many ladies like you that most of them will not care. No. But that's great that you all like, it. I mean, it's good that you all are into this. You know, you're seeing less and less of this stuff. And I think this stuff has got a shelf life and I'm not saying it's coming to a fast end, but I think next five, 10 to 15 years, I'm really worried about where this history is going because I don't really see the young people getting involved in it. The teenagers, the 20, 20, 25 year olds, it seems like, you know, they're into the video games, they're into their cell phones, they're into this or into that, but I don't see, you know, I go to these five or six times a year, you know, these 
Lenny Pond get together in uh, in the fall. <clears throat> the Moonshine and Racers reunion at at uh, Mount Airy, uh, Daytona. You go to these two or three events down there. Like this moonshine thing, there'll be several thousand people there. But you look at it, you don't see a lot of teenagers, a lot of, you know, 25 year olds. Most of the people you see there are 40s started, but really you get into your 50s, 60s, age group, 70s. That's the people you see. And, you know, NASCAR needs to get the younger people into it, but I don't, I don't know if it's gonna happen or not. It's not like it was, I mean, when I was young, when I was a teenager, 20, 25, man, I ate it, slept it, breathed it. You know, you want to be working on the car, you want to be around it. You went around the car, you was at a service station helping on the car. We, of course, we was in the service station business for years, had a gold station down the street here. So <clears throat> it was our life, but I don't see kids getting into this stuff like, like we did. So I'm interested to see uh, if you're under the age of 35, leave a comment on this video and see how old you are. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know a lot of people who watch these are older than me and I'm 27, but it's, it'd be interesting to know how many are that uh, have gotten into this stuff recently to see if it is gaining yeah, traction. Yeah, I, hey, I'd like to know myself. I mean, I, like I say, I go around and I'm just going by what I visually see and I don't see, I see some young people, but I don't see a lot. So yeah, it would be great to know. Yeah, to get a Get a busload of high schoolers take them to a racetrack with a bunch of these cars and let them hear them run one time. I think that's all you need. You're, yeah. you're hooked. You're ruined. <laughs> if you can get them involved with it. I'm just lucky I kept one of mine. This is from Bud 500. I guess that's Dover. That was 88. And that was about the time I was hanging it up, getting out of cup and going into late model stock car. A quick story about this. I made the show there a guy by the name of Joe Boer, he was a farmer out of Indiana, I think, but he had driven my dad's cars way back in the day. I'd like to drive your car Sunday, and I said, Dad, Joe, I don't run about four or five races a year, and he said, I'll give you $5,000 and a bag of popcorn, because <laughs> he, he was a popcorn farmer too or something, and he had this big bag of popcorn. And a bag of popcorn. $5,000 <laughs> and a bag of popcorn, and I said, you better go get your uniform on. Because, <laughs> you know, you got, I mean, you know, if I'd finished good, it'd been $2,000 maybe. You know, I mean, what's a good finish? 15th, 20th? He hadn't been driving much in. It was hot that day. About 300 laps in the race, he'd come on the radio and said, Ronnie, go get your uniform on. I'm giving out. <laughs> I said, okay. And Marshall, which was my crew chief then, and two or three of the guys around town here was pitting the car. I was sitting there and I kept standing there in the pits in about 15 minutes, right, and about 15 laps later, he said, Ronnie, you got your uniform on? I said, I'm getting ready to go get it right now, hold on. About 20 laps later, he said, Ronnie, I'm about to pass out. I hope you, I said, I'm just about there. So the NASCAR official comes up to me and says, your driver is, they're saying he's kind of weaving around the track and all. <laughs> and I said, really? He said, yeah, I said, oh. and I said, Joe comes on the coast man. He said, Ronnie, I'm about to pass out. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm on the way to be there in just a minute. He went down in one and I don't know if he blacked out or what he took out Bud Moore's car. It was a white number 41 Monte Carlo, not this car. It's, but he tore it all to pieces. So of course they pulled him in on the hook, took out Bud Moore's car and all, pulled him in the garage area and he come in, he got out and he was blood red. And, we had water hose, I got a picture of water hose in front, water hose in the back, trying to cool him off. And they took him into the uh, emergency room, give him fluids or something. He come out and he said, man, I just couldn't wait any longer. And I said, about the time you got there, I just got my uniform on. And Marshall sat there, he said, you wasn't even going to get in that car. And I said, well, if he wanted to drive it, I was going to let him drive it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that just some of the funny stories that, you know, Crazy things you do. How much did it cost you to fix the car, right? He that was a thing. He would it was a crash clause, you know. Okay. It, you know, <laughs> he paid to fix a car. And the other funny ones I had two guys I got hooked up with about the same time, eighty five, eighty six, from Reno and John Fontana. They were car dealers out of Texas. One of them was working in the movies, did a little bit of movie acting, and he's they wanted to drive, so I took him to I took him to Talladega 
and for the ARCA race and John got out and practiced in the car and he run 195 or something. He made the show, it rained the race out. Or maybe it rained out before qualifying. So they went back to Texas and he done paid to drive the car and said, what's it gonna, he said, now what are we gonna do? And I said, well, you wanna go to Dover? Cause you there's only enough cars there to get, you can make the field. Yeah, I'll go to Dover. Well, I told him at Talladega, hold the car wide open. Don't back out in the corners. <laughs> you know, qualifying not. Okay, so we go to Dover, and I go out in the car and I get in it, and I had it a little bit too tight, you know. He'd only run a few short tracks back in Texas. He didn't have no, only thing he'd really had, he told me he went to Buck Baker Driving School. He said he'd practiced the car some, I say race, he practiced the car somewhere, a little sportsman car, or limited car. So he left our, he went to Buck Baker and did Buck Baker Drive School. Well, I took him, when we went to Dover, he got out to practice and he goes out and warms up the laps. He goes down the back stretch. When he goes in three, he goes straight in the wall. <laughs> and it knocked the motor up out of the frame, broke the, tr it totaled the car. I mean, it destroyed it. I said, John, what, what happened to the car? You went down there and it just went straight. He said, Ron, I went down there and went to turn it. And he just, it went down there, it went straight. Of course, he backed into the wall, said he went straight down in there. He said, well, I did what you said. I said, what's that? And he said, I held it wide open. I, didn't. <laughs> I said, John, you can't run wide open. Dover, you back out. But that's this guy, I did not realize he had no experience in everything. And Dick Beatty, Richard <laughs> Petty, and Bobby Allison come up to me and they said, you're going to get hurt putting these guys in that's got no experience. And I said, well, I got, if I want to race something, I got to do what I got to do. And in NASCAR, I've got this deal where you got to have so much track experience at different classes and all. I don't know if that's when they started, but that kind of got them going in that direction. But, you know, we was doing what we had to do to be able to race. This come off Jimmy Spencer's Daytona car, and I got the picture, I think it was July when he won the race, but I think he won it. Daytona in July and at Talladega, I believe, in 95. Is that the one with the, the cheater spring buckets and I don't know, he stuff. didn't want to really, I, he didn't really want to talk about that for some reason. I went to talk to him. He wouldn't say anything much about <laughs> anything. And Mike Hill didn't say anything. Of course, I didn't get into Mike Hill, but I went to Mike Hill's house, which, you know, he was with Junior for years. And spent about, very nice guy, him and his wife Phyllis, spent about three hours just, I just, sat down shooting a bull and eat a little something with them. I mean, they really treat me like family. And that's just like you're here. I was getting history from them and learning stuff. But Jimmy signed it. He stopped by here about two or three weeks ago, signed it. Mike signed it. And what's the piece of pavement from? That's from our golf station. When he got tore down, uh. I kept one piece of block and you know, it just, piece off the building and got pushed over and I said, well, say one piece. This is the door off of this car and it had been on this car. The left door is what's weird, stayed on this car for years. And a guy over here in town, it looked like this. It was all beat up and all. He took it here about six, eight months ago and he smoothed it. I made this, made it look too nice, really. Yeah. Painted it and I went and had a <clears throat> some of the gold leaf like we run at Daytona the first race. This was 81. My dad and myself at Daytona. So why would you switch from 25 to 41? I did that in 82. I just, why did I do it? It was my dad, it was my dad's number. It's my number for years. And I said, well, I said, you know what? Maybe we uh, change our number. We change our love. Well, that sucked. Yeah. It didn't change. It didn't change thing. The only thing it changed is the numbers yeah. but you know i kind of like the looks of the 41 i kind of like the style of it better than i did at 25 so it was open and i went with it and no it didn't change your look but you know it was a change was and the uh was the advanced auto parts deal your your biggest that sponsor? was the biggest we got had them half the year in 83 and mccord gaskets mccord gaskets give us a thousand dollars for 15 races and I can't remember what Advance Auto gave us, but that was the most we'd ever had. Hmm. And glad, you know, sometimes you're glad to get what you can get. And we're glad to get it. This come off of um, Richard Petty's car. 
in 69, the only year he run forward, and it come out of this trash pile, and when he used to throw stuff away, and Richard signed it, Dale signed it, and it was only ran for one year, and it was actually, it was in his museum for a while. You can see it back in the corner there. Were you the original digger outer of the trash I pile? I was not or? the digger outer, but it it come from a guy with the was with the Woods Brothers for many many years. Same guy as the other. Same guy. He got the two Woods doors. That's where that come from. This is wheels here are called Norris Racing wheels, and might not mean a lot to a lot of people, but I'll just tell you this is Norris and wheeled wheels. These are wheeled. These are Norse. Everybody run different wheels, both most Norse and wheel wheels was the ones that most people run. Then you had a thing that's called a Clements wheel. I never run them, but maybe a few races. That's what was more around when my dad and some of the guys were running back in the uh, <clears throat> 60s, mid 70s. But these are blacky. I got four of these and they were blacky. Anybody heard of a guy by the name of Blacky Wangren? Mm -hmm. And he's the only one that went out of the racetrack at Michigan in about, God, I don't know, probably about 79, somewhere longer. He went actually went out of the racetrack at Michigan. But those, I got four of his wheels. So, that eh, Penske grinder. Wasn't Norris, uh, like, because you had the the Holman Moody double center wheels, but they would get, the brakes couldn't cool. So Norris made those with the holes to I, I, cool the brakes off. You know, I never really knew. I knew, of course, you know, that was great technology for the day, but it got antiquated. Then they went to a better stuff. You know, they went to these those wheels and then the wheel wheels. So they just, you know, the stuff was advancing through the years and I guess getting better. But see, they, they cut this out. These are chrome wheels and we ran them for, I don't know, two or three years, but they, people quit running. They hired different things that they were, couldn't, they were cracking, they couldn't find the cracks. I know they were having trouble keeping the wheel weights on them, hmm. flying off, and we would glue them on, but <clears throat> they finally, I guess, outlawed them. Now everybody that's familiar with scales would be the little computer scales on the floor, and you know, you got your little box you read. It gives you, gets you front rear weights, gives you percentages all there. These are the, what they call the feed grain scales, which a lot of the local racers would know about these, and in the you know 60s and 70s it's what the cup teams the bush teams people all around local racetracks that they had them this is what they would have been using and these are mine these scales are these i'll get you come around here these scales and you know like I tell you, if I don't know something's not right, I'll tell you it's not right, but I know what's right on these. These are Richard Childress scales. I don't know the date he got them. Uh, I haven't never really looked on them, but somewhere in the mid 70s, Richard would have got them. He used them, and then when Ricky Rudd drove the car, they'd weighed Ricky Rudd's car, and then when Dale Earnhardt drove, they used them for Dale's car, and then, I tell you, Bill Blair had them for many years. Bill, Bill Blair Jr. Bill Blair's dad, of course, run in you know way back in the day at the on the beach course and all. But I got them from Bill Blair, and I talked to Kurt about them, and Kurt said, "Yeah," he said, and we used to do the same thing. He said, "You know, you put a string here, and you let the car down on the string. You pull the string back here." let the car down and then you'd have your strain it'd be a tight strain here you know you could strain your car get get the wheelbase the way you want it you know get your pinion angle the way you want it stuff like that so i was talking to kurt and he said yeah that's exactly what i did i strung the car on it so they used these things he didn't know exactly they he said when they went to the electronic scales he said i still used the grain scales a good while to to get the heights and strain the car and do things on the scales cause I could crawl in under. So, you know, these scales have a lot of history and I talked Bill Blair when I get them. I'm very surprised that Richard Childress, I said, if Richard would have known about it, he needed them to put in his museum. Did this come from the car you bought from DeWitt too? That come off, that come off the, 
Benny Parsons car. And I think, I can't swear to, but I think if I'm not mistaken that mm, Joe Milliken might have drove it. Um, some, I'm not sure. But, you know, we got it was the Orange 72 and Travis had did a lot of work on it. Of course, he was a crew chief on it then. So, you know, the car got, we totaled the car and we kept, I got the brake and clutch pedal off of it and I kept this. And of course, you know, we would take the gauges out and the steering wheel unless it's been up and you take what you could off the fire extinguisher and then you get your used car for somebody else if it was stripped down, you would take all of this stuff, put it on the car to be able to race with. And that's, you know, we weren't the only one doing that. It was quite a few people would do that, that underfunded team. And you know, I was a young man, I said, God, Dad, we need to get us a new car like Kyle's. And I said, we need some of these tires like Kyle, and we need some of those motors. Now, you can the reason I'm saying Kyle, because he was close to my age group. And I said, golly, it's killing me to have to run like we run. This is a thing. My dad told me something I've never forgot. He said, come over here. I said, why don't you come over here? And he sat me down on the pit wall or wherever we was, or we were right there close, and we sat down. And he said, if I was Richard Petty, you'd have that car like that. You'd have the new tires, and you have guys help. Yeah, but I cannot afford to do it. We cannot. You want to race, we got to race like we race, or we go broke, and, and we're not going broke over this deal. I worked all my life to get what little I have, and we're not losing it. When you take it over, you can run it how you want to do it. By why I'm doing it, you can run it like I tell you to run. And I said, okay, and I said, I understand, but never forgot what he said. He said, look in those, sip in those stands. How many of them kids up in there, teenagers, 20, 25, 30, don't matter, that'd be 50 of them. How many kids around your age up in there would love to come down here and get this car? That's what he said, I'm telling you, Ronnie, you are lucky to be able to do what you're doing. And I sit there and he said, yeah, I'm telling you, you need listing. And I sit there and he left. And about 10 minutes, here comes Bobby Allison. And Bobby said, I still sat in there pondering over it. I said, I want to talk to you. I said, yeah, about what your dad said. Well, then, see, I knew my dad had went and talked to him, tried to get me, you know, straightened out. So Bobby come and he said, Ronnie, you got to race like your dad can afford to race and like you can afford to race. He said, I know you want tires, I know you want engines, but he said, you cannot afford to break your family over this. And he said, you know, if you get a sponsor and they buy there, do it. But he said, y'all can't do it. And he said, just do the best you can. If it happens, it happens. If it don't, it don't. So okay, thank you. And he left. And I went and told my dad, I said, you're right. And I never forgot that because that's why I say, I'm looking back now how lucky I was get to be a part of it all. And I do think, you know, I was a 78 rookie of the year. I, I ran five Daytona 500s. Um, I got to drive for James Hilton. I was in the first all 200 mile an hour starting field. Every car qualified over 200 in 1986. I was in some bad wrecks, a terrible wreck with this and totaled it. Um, Got out and otherwise and getting, you know, five or six different times, got knocked out, got concussions, few broken bones, otherwise than that, I came up some. As life went on and we're here today, like I told you, I'm a lucky individual. I owe it all to Rayson, I owe it all to Jabe Thomas, my dad, to all the people, the guys that helped me get here. You know, it was a lot of people. I couldn't have done it without the people. It was a lot of people, you know, they didn't, I mean, I had three or four guys. They spent about 10 years, but they didn't even see their, they missed ball games. I don't have any children, but they missed their kids' uh, baseball games, football games, basketball games to get to race with me. So I owe a lot of people a lot of thanks and a lot of gratitude for helping me get to, you know, get to where I'm at right now. So, hey, I take the good with the bad, and it's been a lot of good. Ronnie Thomas is freaking cool. He has an awesome collection. I had no idea he had that much stuff in there. I knew he had some stuff, but I could have never anticipated what 
is going to be in his house. He should literally pave a little parking lot in his front yard and charge admission at his front door because <laughs> we have been in museums that are not as cool as Ronnie Thomas's house. Absolutely. There's a lot of museums that like don't have like a quarter of the cool stuff that he has. Leave a comment. Tell us what your favorite thing is in the museum of Ronnie. I'm going to call this video a museum video of some kind because everybody loves museum videos and might not be public, but his <laughs> house is a personal museum. It is. It's, it's Ronnie's <laughs> personal museum. This is the most inc incredible personal museum I've ever seen. Like, there was even stuff in there we didn't even get to talk about that had nothing to do with um, racing or cars. <laughs> like, just like historical pieces. Fans of World War II might want to ask him about that if you bump into him somewhere. He has uh, jewelry from the mistress of the most famous bad guy in the history of the war of the world is that if i said or told you or showed you a picture of what was on there this video might get banned just really freaking cool so if you haven't yet make sure you hit thumbs up on this video leave a comment tell us what you thought just click on the link for our sponsors if you see a video that has a a, a sponsor insertion in it even if it has nothing to do with you, if you just click on it, they measure those metrics and they value the click, the eyeballs. That's something that they use to renew with our channel. And those go a long way. They're what enabled us to get this car to the point that it is. We're gonna have to find sponsors to put you know, on here that aren't me, because this guy doesn't have the ability to run the entire season. Yeah, if you're going to sponsor a car, you better sponsor my car, too. Where are you racing? It's not even near racing. <laughs> it's got to get, like, put together before you go racing. Yeah, if you want to see uh, more details on the Grand National Super Series car, what my plans are for it, and Logan's Mustang build, go over to Staples 42 Extra channel, and we're going to have a whole video on there explaining that and some more of the ticky tacky of how this actually works and what we're doing with it i don't know what else to say oh you can go to stapletonautoworks.com and find this hat that i'm wearing right now the red stavola style hat yeah yeah we pack and ship those ourselves in here i pack and ship them yeah unless, myself unless i do it i have to pack and ship them sometimes because you're working on your car it has happened not often, but it happens. Okay, we should like redo the briefing of my car because like, again never, for the third time. We never like really went over it. You just like stop. Okay, let's go back over it. Okay. So 